Hello and welcome to this episode of Stage of the Game. Uh, today we're doing an interview with my good friend Thomas Macias. Hello. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and say a little bit how we know each other. Sure. Uh, my name is Thomas Macias. I am currently a stage manager at the Purple Rose Theater Company in Chelsea, Michigan. And that is where I met Owen. We were both apprentices together from 2013, 2014. You came in in December, right? Yep. No, 2013. So I had already been there for three months um, or two months-ish. And uh, <clears throat> Owen came in. We were apprentices for about 10 months together. And then I moved up to stage management while you were finishing your apprenticeship. And then... I was also the ASM while you were acting in a show. You were acting in 2AZ. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, Chelsea, Michigan. The friendships are made. And you're you're still doing stage management, but you're also you're doing improv as well. I do, uh, which is really difficult to uh, continuously mm -hmm. do when you've got a full-time other theater job. Um, but yeah, there's a theater company that opened about a year and a half ago, January of last year, called Pointless in Ann Arbor. And they are, they do only improv, well, hold on, they do long-form improv, and then they do, they have like some children's theater stuff on Saturday mornings sometimes, but they also brew their own beer. Uh, so it's a it's a husband and wife duo and the husband does like the improv and the beer and the wife does like the business side and like the maintenance and everything and they make a great team and this theater started doing classes um a couple months after they opened and i got into the first group of people to do a class and it was uh eight like i think it was eight eight week courses maybe 10 week course i don't remember not that long but like eight eight courses did the entire course load and so now that that's done, my life has no meaning. Um, we just like my my improv class just hung out last week uh, because we missed each other and we just had a cookout at one of our friends' houses nice. and like just trying to <laughs> trying to salvage our relationship as like friends because now that the class is done, we don't have anything to do on Monday nights. So we're but yeah, that's it's it's really improv and the Purple Rose. That's mm -hmm. that's where my life is right now. Uh, so I guess we'll talk a little bit about um, your history with theater and how you got into the theater. Totally, yeah. So I guess the very first thing that I remember was in seventh grade in high school. I went to high school in upstate New York, and we had a science teacher named Mr. Mancuso, who was a magician himself, and he had a magic club, like not Magic the Gathering, but performance magic. And at the end of every year, they, the people in the club who wanted to put on a magic show. And so I did that in seventh grade and I did that in eighth grade again. And then I helped out with it in ninth grade. Um, and then either ninth or 10th, I think I was, a, I think I was a sophomore in high school. Um, they were doing auditions for She Stoops to Conquer and you needed to sign up to do these auditions with a friend. You had to sign up in pairs and I had five friends who wanted to do it. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'll sign up with this, with this fifth, fifth person, um, <clears throat> ended up that she didn't get in, but I did, uh, but she was totally cool. She was just trying it for the lulls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then I've kind of been involved with theater since then. Didn't really look at it as a career until like sophomore year of college when, uh, I was studying film and kind of had a mini panic attack in my documentary film class because I realized that I didn't want to do this, so why am I taking classes to learn about it? And uh, started the process to become a film theater major because my college didn't have a theater major, so I kind of like created my own thing and uh, graduated from there and then made my way to the Purple Rose. Yeah, great. Now, because obviously this is a theater and video game podcast, I want, I want you to talk about your, uh, your history with video games and which got you started <clears throat> on that path. Totally. Um... The first video game I remember was the um, like the original Nintendo with Duck Hunt and Super Mario Brothers, the first one. And like I remember my dad like teaching me how to shoot with the gun. That's the closest he ever got really to teaching me how to hunt was <laughs> on on a TV screen. Um, <clears throat> and like we like we loved it. My mom like even though it was a little bit violent, it was shooting ducks, but she was still into it and she loved Super Mario. Um, we were a Nintendo household growing up. I'm the oldest of five. And so like the fact that Nintendo has a lot of 
uh, multiplayer games, up to four players, Mario Party and stuff like that. That was a real big selling point for not only my mother, but for us children. When we wanted to advocate for a video game, it had to be like multiplayer. When we were like, ah, like, but like Mario Kart and like she loves Mario Kart now. But like I remember like first Mario Kart, second Mario Kart. And we were, we were always also like behind the curve um, when it came to video games. Like I remember being so excited getting Mario Tennis um, and my friends like it was like two and a half years after it came out. Like mm-hmm. people were done. It was it was behind them. But we were like, yeah, <laughs> Mario Tennis. Um, uh so yeah, so so and and like video games a lot for me, especially growing up, had a lot to do with family. Like that was, um, we would hang out a lot playing video games and just laughing and playing. So that's uh, a lot of my memories growing up with my siblings have are game centric, if not video games, then maybe chess or maybe a card game with my grandparents or something like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's very different from mine. It was my my parents hated video games we didn't have them in the house <laughs> right. up until i was uh in high school mm-hmm. so i was kind of thinking that my friends would i i'd see at my friend's house is that every time i would go over there like i want to play i want to oh, play video for sure games. well and i didn't like i would definitely play video games when i went to my friend's houses because we only had the nintendo games mm, we didn't course. have like the cool like playstation like ratchet and clank like oh my like every time we went to our mm-hmm. cousin's place like i like i wanted to play ratchet and clank because there was no way we were gonna because we would have to get the playstation and the video game so mm-hmm. it was um it was a good way for a for like us to branch out and then like on like the only computer games we had were like the the fifth grade adventure fourth grade adventure like learning how to spell Uh, sort of video games but i think i perfected those games so (laughs) i feel pretty good about myself yeah 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 uh what games you're currently playing what games am i currently playing uh well uh in the past couple of months i just finished borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel um which again like behind the curve those Mm -hmm. games have been out for a while but i finally did it i actually just recently like in the last year got like a pc that i hopefully will like like i've really only used it for like movies and video games and it's just that's that's what i'm that's what it's going to be used for and it will be good forever even when things get much better it'll still be at least like it's it's it'll be fine Mm -hmm. um my sister just got me into Paladins, which is a free-to-play, um, like, TF2 style uh, or Overwatch style, I guess, now, um, video game where it's just teams you play as a character with uh, various different abilities, and then you fight other teams. Um, Gary, tech director at mm-hmm. the Purple Rose, uh, has been trying to get me to play Payday 2 a lot, and we've played a couple of times. Um I played it for like the first hour I played it. I did not like it because I was bad at the game. And first person shooters aren't my forte because I grew up playing Mm -hmm. uh, Mario Kart. Uh, But I've gotten a lot better at it. Um, And now now it's at the point where like it's actually kind of fun. And Mm -hmm. so um, it's and so like he right now they're building the set for the next show. So we probably won't play again for another month or so. But I'll look forward to playing that again because it's a lot of fun. Are there any games that are coming out and that you are looking forward to? Any game? Well, you know, I don't. So you're not really a console gamer. Not currently. No, I don't really have anything. Um, I don't have a console here. We ha- that's a lie. My roommate Adair, she has a Wii, and so we have it. It's not hooked up to anything right now, though. Um, I mean, I play iPhone games like Two Dots. I haven't played Two Dots in a long time. I do the New York Times crossword puzzle. That's a good one. Um, and the Starbucks summer game, getting those getting those stars. Um, but as far as video, like I like I, I like the idea of the Switch. And I've seen, like, I've literally watched children play it mm-hmm. outside and be like, oh, like, I just kind of like want to watch them play it. I don't like, I would love to play it, but like, I don't want to be the dude the you know 25 year old guy who asked a kid to let me play with their video game like i <laughs> totally content to just creepily look over their shoulder like mm-hmm. if they would let me that's totally fine um <clears throat> the switch looks cool like i have any like even i've watched a lot of gameplay of uh the new uh legend of zelda game the open world one <sighs> the wind breath of the, wild. Like, breath of the wild not even wind um, and it looks beautiful. It looks gorgeous. Probably never going to play it because I don't have it. And by the time I get a console that might be able to play it, I it'll be five years from now, ten years from now. So, so yeah. Um, but I'm always like, I mean, I keep 
watching other people play video games and it's fun i'm looking forward to playing the stanley parable i bought that again behind the times it's been a while but i have it um and oh i was playing through grim fandango uh remastered so and the newer version um but again i'm like halfway through it and i haven't finished it um so maybe not the best person to ask about what's up next because i'm not i'm not there i'm not there well i'm gonna recommend a game to you I don't know okay. how to do this, but I feel like there's a game that's coming out uh, this next month that I feel like you would actually really like. Um, What's that? At least there's a lot of hype behind it, and I feel like it's something you would enjoy a lot. It's called Cuphead, if you've heard of it. Is that the one? I don't think it is. Is that the one that's drawn like... It is. Uh, okay, but like an old, old like cartoon. Old cartoon. Yeah, it's going to be for Xbox, Xbox and PC. Oh, awesome. Is it like? Is there any like beta out or anything, or is it going to come out like in a couple months? No, it's the game's coming out uh, gotcha. September 29th. It's going to be I think twenty bucks. Maybe. Cool. That's that. I I can yeah, do that. It's going to be like I think it's like a platformer. Cool, cool. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a little bit of gameplay, just like the the advertisements of it, and it like I feel like I saw it like a month or two ago, and then I haven't seen anything about it probably because yeah. I mean that was probably that was probably like the yet. E3 stuff that you saw. Sure. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Cuphead. I definitely I had I have heard of that one. So mm-hmm. but, there you go. Yeah, I feel like that's the game up your alley that's coming out. So that's cool. Something. Yeah, um, totally. Now, uh, before I go into questions about like the theater industry and gaming industry that I wanted to pose to, I have do have to mention that like you are indirectly a big reason of why I ended up starting this podcast. Oh yeah. Uh, and I say I say it indirectly because you are the you're the reason that I got into watching. Uh, Rooster Teeth. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. And, and of course, watching Rooster Teeth, I, I I started off watching Achievement Hunter and then mm-hmm. moved on to all the other Achie- Rooster Teeth sub things, which has grown to significantly in the past couple of years. Oh, yeah, totally. They're streaming now. They've got, yeah, tons of content, tons and tons of content. But what really inspired me was, uh, I don't know, don't you, do you watch any of Bernie's vlogs? Yeah. I so I'm I don't I'm still subscribed and I see them every time. I probably only watched like two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, no, I, I know. Uh, I love his vlogs. They're all like I find them very inspirational. And there was one about like motivation and just like going and doing things and like yeah, I just need to go and do this. So indirectly, awesome. you were a reason because I would have never yes. seen that and I would never would have done that. I, I probably you know, uh, maybe who knows. But, yeah, maybe eventually, because like I remember when I started talking to you about it, I was surprised that you didn't know it because mm-hmm. uh, like we are their demographic, mm-hmm. like people, people who <laughs> like video games and are, you know, uh, people who watch YouTube videos. Um, I I would venture maybe you still watch you watch more YouTube videos now than I still do. But I, that's not to say that I don't anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm still like I'm subscribed to like probably like a good 75, 80 channels that I've never clicked on again since I first started watching them. Um, but there's just good content out there and people yeah. are smart and intelligent and they talk about game design and they're just funny and it's it's really interesting. So yeah. It's amazing. I probably watch podcasts and like YouTube, like online videos content. It was ma- my main source of entertainment at this point. I, I've, <laughs> stopped, so- I've stopped watching TV and I don't really go to the movies that often. Mm-hmm. So Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can bring the movies home. Yeah, exactly. totally. I, same <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, so there are a couple questions I wanted to pose to you about uh, theater and gaming in total. Okay. And in uh, now I post this. Uh, you probably saw. You said you watched the interview that I did with my friend Andrew. I'm going to pose the same question about uh, the game, the theater industry, to you. Okay. Um, does and this this comes directly as a uh, response to. Uh, one, another one of Bernie's vlogs they did mm-hmm. about the entertainment industry and it got me thinking does theater is theater part of the entertainment industry does it fall under that same thing it's just something that got that got me thinking a lot and I wanted to know what other people thought yeah totally well I liked I liked your response um I liked the response from the last video or the last interview you did and it like about how when you think of entertainment, you think of the commercialized product of movies and Netflix and Game of Thrones and things like that. Um, I probably would still say that, like, people do think of theater, like, if you're thinking about a nice place to go on a date or you're trying to, like, maybe just do something more than, like, something extra, I think theater is still 
uh, within the realm of what people think of. But I totally agree with Andrew, right? He mm -hmm. was who you were interviewing. Totally agree with him that it's not what people first think of. Mm -hmm. People, when you think of theater, you think, oh, I have to spend $752 on a ticket to Hamilton. And that's just not true. You can go, like, the Pointless Brewery uh, in Ann Arbor has improv shows every Friday and Saturday night at 8 and 10 o'clock, and they are 10 bucks and cheaper if you're a student. Like, there's accessible live theater around uh, Purple Rose in Chelsea. We've got a couple more out in Williamson and Tipping Point out in Northville. There's a bunch in Detroit. There's a lot of stuff that is affordable if you are looking for it. Um, a lot of, like, even Purple Rose, we have half price student tickets, and that's, you know, if I was around, I would see every single show. I, you can usher with us, and you can get your ticket for free. Um, as much as I think, I think I'm probably in between. Is it mm -hmm. entertainment? Yes, it is entertainment. Is it the in like we're not in the business of making money through our art. We're in the business of making art and providing providing something beautiful for our community. And we are an economic engine. Our theater. Uh, pulls in a lot of revenue for local businesses. People wouldn't come to Chelsea usually unless if, if the Purple Rose and our you know major restaurant, the Common Grill, if we weren't there. Um, that's not to say we don't have other wonderful businesses because we totally do. But people just wouldn't find them if there wasn't a bigger draw. And that's you know a definite positive thing that the that theater has brought to the community. Great answer. I I, I agreed completely. Thank that's you. you probably heard. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, another question I'd like to hear your thoughts on this upcoming uh, upcoming uh, slot of shows that are slated to come to Broadway this year um, a lot of them um, things shows like uh, Frozen Anastasia Mean Girls Spongebob Harry Potter they're all really big names very very commercial names that like that's going to be a very big budget a lot of money but it's I feel like it's going to draw like a different crowd to Broadway. And I just wanted to know your take on seeing these shows. Is it a good thing that they're coming to Broadway? Is it a bad thing? How do you feel about it? I, I, yeah, I think you'd be hard pressed to name a show for me that I think would be a bad idea to go to Broadway. Um, like, I feel like a lot of people who are, uh, I've found that a lot of people can be very upset that there's a new, like they're making uh, Frozen or Harry Potter or whatever, like they're going to ruin the original. And like, that's just not true. Mm -hmm. It's the original is always going to be there. You're going, it's just a new take and maybe it'll suck. You're totally right. It could totally suck, but maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be really cool. Um, I've been a huge fan of the SpongeBob musical ever since it uh, was in Chicago. I haven't listened to all the music yet, but I keep trying to like, tell everybody when it comes up in conversation i'm like but wait did you see who's worked on this show like yes it's a commercial it's spongebob there's not much more commercial than that but you've got all of these rock legends who've written songs for this show are you kidding me you're gonna pass that up just like give it a chance and mm -hmm. i think that that's why they got a lot of these people to do it because they have such big pull um frozen i'm really interested to see what they do i think their poster art is really elegant and really interesting because they didn't go the classic disney route they didn't go like the shrek the musical route with it they went a little bit more like um it's still frozen don't get us wrong but it's a little bit a little bit more elegant maybe and so that's that's uh i think perhaps promising to see what what they could do with it um harry potter I mean, it won a whole bunch of Olivier Awards on the West End. It's a good production from a critical standpoint. Um, I'm sure it's going to bring a lot of new people, like you said, to the theater. And I don't think that's ever a bad thing. I think it's the first step. First step is getting them to see theater. Second step is getting them to see a show they've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. if, they, if, if, that, if those two steps can happen, then, then like the whole world is open. Like going to see an improv show. Even if your friend's in the improv show, cool, go see it. You're going to like it more than you thought. We went to see a show in Chicago. We went to see, uh, uh, what was it, Messing? What, it wasn't messing with a friend. Maybe it was. Um, but a two-person improv show. And I I knew more about it than you did, but you still had a wonderful time, yeah. I think. Um, I hope. It seemed no, like you I did. did. <laughs> <Good night. laughs> um, um, but it was just a way, like, and I feel like you were more comfortable being introduced with it because I brought you there. And so, like, if you're familiar with the medium, you'll have a better chance of maybe exploring things beyond it. So I think, I think it's great. Um, and... 
I think Broadway is already commercialized, so we can't get more commercialized. Like, it's not going to be super saturated. Um, but you're still going to find Dear Evan Hansen's. You're going to find Natasha and Pierre. You're going to find Hamilton. You're going to, like, that stuff is still going to happen. Um, there's no reason why big commercial stuff can't either, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. Hey, now in terms of uh, questions about video games, uh, there has been a lot of discussion. Re I mean, I can't really pose this question to you because you're not a console gamer. Uh, I can try. Okay. I mean, you could give, give it to me and then I'll tell you. I don't okay. know anything. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's been a lot of discussion about console exclusivity lately um, and uh if that's good for the industry or and people have like, it's been a debate, like is console exclusivity good? Is it bad? Is it taking people away from games? How do you feel? I, I would say, again, not educating myself on the specific subject, mm -hmm. but in general exclusivity, I find as not a good thing. Um, I think especially in, um, well, I guess you could even relate it back to theater. Like if we if we can give access to people to something that they wouldn't normally get, they have a better chance of coming back to us if we're looking at it from a business perspective. So um, if they, you know, try to let's say there's like a really great video game based on Hamilton the musical and it's a really great video game, not like a really bad video game like those tend to be. Um, let's say it's a really great video game, but it's only released for Nintendo. You're not going to get... Uh, you're not going to get people who play Xbox or PlayStation to play that game, unfortunately, because they're just not going to get it. But if you broaden the scope, that gives another bunch of people a chance to interact with this game. And granted, most everybody knows about Hamilton, but maybe you'll reach some people who don't. And then you can and then they can get into it and then they can learn about it. And then they may, might want to maybe not get a ticket, but like read some books on it or get the cast album. Like there's no the the it kind of is counterintuitive from a business sense but it's totally intuitive if you take that extra step of like well no if you provide them with something and it's really great they're going to come back they're going to come back okay. and probably the reason i want to ask you that question specifically is um to turn it back to theater shows like uh harry potter uh and the cursed child i'm mm -hmm. sure you've read the you read the play no oh god <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that ruins everything. <laughs> Ruined your whole plan. No, but I've read all the books. I've read them multiple yes. times. I've seen the movies. Well, mainly I wanted to talk about the play specifically because, well, you you you've seen production photos. You know much. You, yes. I'm sure you know a I, lot about and, it. And I'm and I'm yeah, yes, I'm I am familiar with it. I just but, have not read the play. Well, uh, the reason I have a problem with it, um, and not like, and that has nothing to do with the plot. It's that there are such like the, the the play itself calls for such elaborate technical things that need to happen on stage that like are part like need to happen and which make it such a great show is because of the spectacle about it but again problem with that is that this show can't really be done off broadway like ever like local theaters will never get to do this like it's going to be even hard for regional, a lot of regional theaters to be able to do this for like uh, for the size of the show and the, like, the amount of money it's going to cost to produce this show. And I don't like shows like that. I don't like shows that like, oh, once it's off-Broadway, you'll never get a chance to see it ever again because there's no way it, it can be produced somewhere else. And I'm sure there people can find a way to do it, but there's always going to be people, people saying, well, it's nothing like the Broadway production because the Broadway had this and this and this and this because they had the budget. Sure. I'd like to know your opinion on that. I think I think you've got a really great point there that like I remember when I saw Follies on Broadway mm -hmm. uh, with Bernadette Peters and like I remember walking away from that show being like I'm never going to see original production of this show like it needs to have this like like it's these women who used to be like essentially Broadway stars and are like this huge lavish set and lavish costumes and all that stuff blah 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 blah. Um <clears throat> and uh, now, a couple years later, kind of looking back on that, I feel a little differently. Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially with a place like the Purple Rose, we're we're, um, we're in a thrust space. We've got mm -hmm. audiences on three sides of us. We only seat 168 people, mm -hmm. or small, intimate space. 
And to put on shows, we need to be um, in some ways a little bit more creative to figure out, well, everybody needs to see this moment. Everybody needs to see this prop. Everybody needs to see this. Where can we put it on stage so that it can be seen? And that's a very small thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So you'd have to multiply that by like literally like 500,000 for an entire show like Harry Potter. Um, But like, as you were talking about it, I think like, wouldn't it be cool if like a children's theater put on Harry Potter and instead of like this lavish way to make someone disappear, we had like two people in magic suits walk up and hug the person and take them away or something like that. Like what, what ways could we create something new out of this thing that you're right. There's no way that we can put a trap door in our, in our facility. There's Mm -hmm. just, just not going to happen. So how could we do it otherwise? And not necessarily to fool the audience. Cause I don't think we're in the business of fooling people. I think we're in the business of telling stories. And so if we can just continue telling that story believably in that world, in whatever world we create, I think that we've got a shot. Um, I, but I totally think you're right that I, I I doubt that a theater like ours would probably take a chance on Harry Potter because there's so many choices like that that we would have to make before we would even consider doing it because mm-hmm. that affects lights, that affects sound, that affects costumes, that affects cast sizes. Like if you have an extra like four people who are the magic people who do the magic, then that's going to be more stuff. Um, so um, I think that it shouldn't be completely counted out, but I but. Theater is expensive. It costs a lot of money to put this stuff on. But I also think you get a group of college students together who want to do this show. I I, I directed a sh- I directed a production of Doctor Horrible Sing Along Blog, which is not Harry Potter, granted. Mm-hmm. Um, but like that was a web series that had some special effects, and we had to make do without that stuff. And we told the story, and it worked. Um, so if you get passionate college students together i'm sure they could come up come together and make something really beautiful out of it so i don't think it's completely lost um but maybe as a business venture we won't see a major production anywhere except for like off off broadway or like la or you know maybe you know paris the french version and people will flock to see that one too so okay well thank you for your input uh we're up at close to a half hour at this point um Okay. Yeah, that's a good stopping point. Um, if you want to take this time to plug any upcoming shows, any groups that you know, anything at all, or or plug yourself at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would always say come to the Purple Rose if you're in Southeast Michigan. Um, we are in rehearsals right now for God of Carnage by Yasmina Riza, which is a play that premiered on Broadway in 2009 with our founder, Jeff Daniels. So there's a little bit of a connection there for us. Um, we've only just started. Today was the second day of rehearsal, so we've got a lot more to do, but it's it's going to be really wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and then the rest of our season is three new plays, three new world premieres. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, other places in... Michigan. Uh, I honestly am so glad that I've moved here because I've been able to learn more about this place and it's made me want to find out more about theater in everywhere, like in Utah and Idaho and Ecuador, like every place must have great theater if we also have great theater. And so um, really just look like you can search regional productions, you can search theater, you can like go see a show at your high school. It's, it's going to be an experience. Um, Pointless Brewery and Theater down in Ann Arbor, one of the best improv places around. There's also Go Comedy up in uh, Ferndale and Planet Ant down in Hamtramck, both also really good. Ann Arbor is just closer to me, so that's why I, I go there. Um, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't really have any projects, but if you play Paladins, you should come find me on Paladins. But uh, yeah, that's that's about it, I think. Well, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak with me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. No problem. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and I'll see you next week. Bye.